Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who just love their plants. But just not always the same ones. I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the executive editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Steve Aiken. I'm the editor at large uh, of Fine Gardening Magazine, the greatest magazine on the planet. <laughs> and, and yet today we're not going to talk about plants, given that we work for a gardening magazine and we have a gardening and plant podcast, but well, no, we are, we're going to talk about plants, but this I'm, is our very, I'm going to talk about very little other than plants. I don't know what you're planning <laughs> on. What's our topic well, today? Today is our Q and a session okay. and uh, listeners, we just want to say thank you so much. We've been doing this for, I guess, a couple of years. This might be our third Q&A. We do one a year at least. And uh, sometimes it can be a struggle for us to get questions, but we got flooded with questions. So uh, we were pleasantly surprised. Some of them we don't know how to answer. Some of them we thought very intriguing. Uh, some of them uh basically we just thought wow this is a this is a larger topic that maybe we'll discuss in an article in the magazine or maybe we'll discuss down the road in a yeah. podcast but uh we, we and, picked and, some good ones yeah and there are some questions where we just don't know the answer yeah you know and, and like i i you, one thing i don't like about uh radio like call in with your question things is the guy who acts like he can, the guy or gal or person who acts like they can answer every question. They know the answer to every question. And I'm like, yeah. there's no way you could know that. And like there, there could be a zillion different things about, you know, um, yeah. and we don't, we don't pretend to do that. So we're, we're going to answer the questions that we can answer um, mm -hmm. and that we have time for. There are other questions that we could have answered, uh, but there's some of your questions. We just don't know the answer to, and we're not going to, to, BS you and, you know, try to look like we know something that we don't. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, let's, I'm going to jump right in because we've got a bunch of them to get through. Let's see how many cool. we get through here. Are you ready? I'll go with my first one. Um, okay. So North star German, this was off of Instagram. This North star German asks, I have so many plants on my wish list. Ditto that I can't seem to track down. And then this person goes on to list several, a little bit more rare um, plants. How do I find these plants? Am I shopping in the wrong season? And uh, this just hit home. This is the first question that jumped out at me because Steve, how many times do we get letters into the magazine saying, sources, sources, I, you gave me sources and I can't find them. I went to that website and I can't, they're sold out, they're sold out. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's it, it's it's hard to find plants. But uh, one of the things you have to do as a gardener is sort of embrace the chase, you know, yeah. um, you know like and, and enjoy the hunt, you know, for these things. I like that. But, you know, uh, North Star German, it's funny to say that as a name, but I would say that timing, yes, timing is a factor. In fact, um, right now, if you go online and you look for any plant through online mail order sources, most of them are going to say sold out. And the reason being is they're not shipping plants right now. It is winter. They are busy growing the plants. They are busy doing their catalogs and their online sites. And pretty much every single plant you look for, I, uh, for instance, yesterday I was looking for a list of 12 different plants and everything said sold out. In which case, call the company. There's usually customer service lines and you can say, hey, when is this going to be back in stock? Is it going to be back in stock? And when should I be shopping? I would say late February, early March is prime time. But you have to bear in mind that everybody else in the country is also shopping for plants in late February, early March. And there's a finite number of plants in stock that these companies carry, um, which trickles down to over the years, the number of plant mail order sources has declined exponentially. It, they're just, they keep closing up shop. And every single time we put out an article in the magazine, we keep our fingers crossed that that source we listed is still going to be in business by the time the magazine gets printed. Um, I'll also say I've been answering uh, questions about this through the magazine that the pandemic was great for gardening. <laughs> I mean, 
in brick and mortar nurseries, online mail order nurseries, so many people got into gardening this year or, you know, even expanded on their gardening this year that these places weren't ready for that. And they sold out and then sold out from what they sold out from. It was a really, really intense year to try and find plants. So, you know, all of those things I would say were fa- are factors in trying to source plants. But um, the one other, the last thing I did want to mention was a, a resource that we use at the magazine. And uh, that's the University of Minnesota's Plant Search online. And that's plantinfo.umn.edu. And that allows you to put in the Latin name of a plant and search retail locations and mail order locations or even references to that plant in other online resources. So you could even get information about the plant. Um, It's not foolproof, but it's a good starting place um, for trying to find and track down plants. So if you're going to an actual nursery, I would add that uh, they tend to stock, th- they will stock things when they look their best. So mm-hmm. they will stock things when they are in bloom. Um, mm-hmm. And they will not stock things generally if they haven't broken dormancy yet or they haven't fluffed up in the pot to, to, to look good enough. They'll stay at the wholesaler and they'll, they'll come out after them. Um, and, and that said, you, you kind of have to hunt for the nurseries that will have the more unusual things. Um, you never know what's going to pop up where. And nurseries have to stock kind of the basic common run-of-the-mill stuff because they know that's what's going to sell. They, they have to make money. And so uh, uh, stocking something that they're not sure is going to sell is a risk for them. You know, um, So you can, you can always ask at your local nursery. You can talk to other friends like, where did you get that plant? And can I have a division, Danielle? Um, that, that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes I've had nurseries offer to order the plants for me. Yeah. You know? Um, or they said, you know, them. hey, we have, we have we have we have more back at the farm. Oh, okay, yeah. Great, you know. um, but it's yeah. it, it's a hunt. It's a hunt. Um, and you know, it, whenever we put like a piece of art in the magazine, everyone wants to know where I can get where can I get that piece of art. There's a cool sculpture. Oh, there's like a cool pop. Art and- yeah. Yep. And, and you you can't get that at Home Depot. If you could get that at Home Depot, <laughs> then everyone would have it. You know, and so the the things you want are always kind of the hardest to get. And so you have to kind of embrace the search. Um, Google is wonderful. Um, friends, like, hey, who's got a good nursery? Who stocks interesting things? And even if the nursery doesn't have what you're looking for, are they stocking things that are out of the ordinary or, or you, mm-hmm. unusual from what you're seeing in other nurseries? That's a place you want to go back to and check. Yeah, uh, yeah that, would, that yeah, would be definitely. my two cents on that. That's perfect. Oh, North Star German, I did want to tell you that of the plants that you listed, Far Reaches Farms, which is out in Port Washington, and they are a in Port Port Washington, Washington, or uh, Port Towns in Washington. Sorry, Washington, Washington. Uh, they do carry, uh, I believe, four out of your five plants that you listed. They're out of stock right now, but as I said at the beginning. That's because of the time of year. So I would check back with them mail order wise on whether or not you could get those plants. All right, Steve, what do you got? Uh, Lynn Garner uh, asks, uh, <laughs> she's wondering if we can suggest uh, some interesting annuals for containers. Uh, she'd like to start annuals from seed that are different from what you normally find at most nurseries. Um, I, I, again, like most nurseries stock what they know is going to sell. And that's usually the common things. Uh, but we usually like, Petunia. you know, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> Um, and there's there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, usually we like something different to spice up our containers. Um, and there's there's a lot of things that you can grow. What I like to do um, is to go through catalogs like Annie's Annuals um, or Select Seed um, or any of the seed companies and look for things that I don't know. Like I've never heard of that plant. And then I'll try to grow it because the seed pack is a couple bucks. Maybe you try it, you throw it in with your other order. Um, and you can find some some wonderful things uh, through there. Um, the plants I'm going to recommend, um, the first one I'm going to re- recommend is, is, is shrimp plant, um, Packy Stackies uh, Lutea. Uh, <laughs> That's a great name, Packy Stackies. Yeah. Um, it's called shrimp plant or it's called lollipop plant. And it has these, uh, these sort of shiny uh, golden mustard cones with little white flippers that come out of them. And they're supposed to look kind of like a shrimp. Uh, I don't know much about shrimp. I don't eat shrimp. Um, 
but they're they're sort of like a, a shrimp shaped uh, ice cream cone looking thing, um, which sounds freaky. But it, when you Google it online, or we'll put up a picture uh, uh, on the website, um, it's not that freaky. It's a it's a tropical. It wants to be a tropical shrub, but you're not going to grow it that way. Um, so expect it to get around two feet. It's it's bushy. And um, the, I would say the flowers are a good, are good six to eight inches and born in profusion on these things. Um, really striking uh, shrimp plant, uh, Pachystachys uh, lutea. Uh, I would also recommend um, Five Spot, which is Nemophila maculata, uh, which is just a little guy. It's a little, um, it, it, it trails a little bit, doesn't, doesn't get massive, uh, but it has these little white uh, cup shaped uh, flowers with perfect purple spots all around uh, the edges of them. There's five spots. There's five of them around the petals. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a little charmer. Always makes you smile uh, when, when you see it. Um, and the, the Latin name is uh, Nemo, N-E-M-O, uh, Phila, F-I-L-A, uh, which, which makes me sound, it, it, to me, it always reminds me that you, you love the, the adorable little clownfish from the movies. Um, oh. you know? And so like, it's, just, it's just a happy plant all around. Um, it is a cool season plant. So it thrives in spring and fall and can kind of peter out in the summer. Um, I've had that experience. I've had other people in colder climates in Connecticut say, no, it grows just fine all through the year because it's cooler up there. Um, but that's a good one. And then um, there's another one called uh, Cerinthi uh, Major. Cerinthi Major purpurescens is a cultivar. I think the common name is honeywort which I don't understand at all. Uh, but you get these silvery blue-green leaves. They're sort of like pea leaves. They're, they're kind of like uh, baptisia leaves, but on a smaller plant. And you get these 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 nodding uh, bell-shaped flowers that are a wonderful, dusky, deep, intense purple, like mm -hmm. like like a, a like a ripe conquered grape purple. Um, and it's just it's maybe like a I would say like a foot or two tall. And then the um, the flowers kind of hang down. So it, ha it just really has like an interesting round, fluffy uh, texture to it. Um, I will say this. I have found that when I've grown it, 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 it and not fed it and, and watered it, it has, it has turned out a lot smaller than you see in the pictures. Usually in the pictures, and this happens with a lot of small flowered things, like a picture in a magazine, they will zoom in on, on the, the, the flower. And you'll think that's a really big flower. And then you'll, you'll get it home and it's, it's, you know, it's like less than the size of a dime. You're like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. what, you know. Uh, and, and so I found this one to be a little smaller than, than I expected. Um, so you've got you've got Cerinthi Major, Purpurescens, Honeywort. You've got Five Spot, Nemophila Maculata, and Shrimp Plant, uh, Pachystachys lutea. Those, are, those mm -hmm. are three good ones to go uh, searching for that will add uh, a little zip to, to the containers this year. Those are really great suggestions. Yeah. The, I, I actually, I think we talked about this in our true blue episode that I grow nemophila. I call it nemophilia, but nemophila too. And, uh, I do the, 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 I don't know the species name, but the, the baby blue eyes. It's just a really, really beautiful, light, gorgeous blue color with a white, kind of center and a black eye, which is really beautiful. Um, I will say with that plant across the board, it resents standing water. It resents wet feet. So do not overwater that puppy. It, it, it doesn't like it. Um, and the last, I, I just want to add, I love gumfrina and gumfrina you find all the time as a, as a, you know, pack annual, which is just these little itty bitty tiny things with like puff balls that are kind of crispy and usually you see like grape alicious and they you only see them in purple and magenta but there's gumfrina fireworks is one that I've loved for years and it gets tall and wispy and it has those straw like magenta flowers pom poms up at the top of it but then out of it shoots these little yellow anthers so it really does look like fireworks and I think it's a really nice substitute and a little more eye catching than uh, tall verbena, verbena uh, banaran, banariensis, uh, and it's a great cup flower too. So if I'm going to yeah. do, if I'm going to do an annual, I'm going to get it in a container. I'm going to put it in my beds, and I also want to be able to cut it. So that's that. That would be my my go to. Yeah, uh, my I was going to put gomfrina on here, but I wasn't sure how common that was because I can mm -hmm. usually find gomfrina in the nurseries. It's just never the one I want. Yeah, it's usually 
Yeah, I want Strawberry Fields, which is an intense red. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's yeah. a new one that uh, I don't know if, if that magazine, if that issue has come out yet, um, where we just did the, the Gotta Have It plant is this new Gumfrina with chartreuse foliage. It actually uh, looks just like cool. fireworks, but with chartreuse foliage. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the name of that, but yeah, yeah. check out. But, 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 but yeah, you could you, you can also try verbena banana ramarant fences or whatever uh Danielle wants to call it. I Most like of us know it as- <laughs> All, right. All right, next question, Danielle. All right, my next question is from Anita Oliver 07. Uh that the, this came in through Instagram as well. All right, Anita asks, hopefully we will be installing a new landscape in 2021. Is there a general rule of thumb for the percentage of plants which should be evergreen slash conifers? This landscaping will be at the front of our house, which mostly has a west exposure. I live in zone seven. First off, can I say thank you for telling us what zone you live in? With Q&A, it's so much easier when you let us know where you live in the country. So, you know, we're not recommending zone three plants and you live in South Texas. Sorry, um, <laughs> who, who, who sent in this question? This is Anita Oliver 07. Okay, okay. no, because the, the next question I'm going to answer is pretty much the same thing. So go rock on and I'll just jump <laughs> on on the back end. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Uh, well, so it was it was interesting because I had a percentage in my. OK, so Steve, let me ask you, what percentage would you say? Just off the top of your head. Well, I, you know, I looked at this question. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, I would say it depends on where you are. The colder. Um, you live, the more winter interest you're going to want to have and the more evergreen exactly. I think you're going to want to have. Um, so it, and that, you know, and in was, zone seven, I would say you, you want at least 30%, you know, all right. it, 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 so, depends on, it depends on personal taste too. Yes, it does. So, so I went on to APLD, uh, so the Association of Professional Landscape Designers, and their rule of thumb is 50% evergreen, 25% deciduous shrubs and 25% perennials. So that was interesting. I thought that was a little high. I thought that was a little high. So, you know, I started thinking about it in my own landscape, you know, and that, you know, hey, that's, that's a standard rule of thumb. I started thinking about it in my own landscape because I've got primarily a shrub based landscape. We've talked about this ad nauseum, but I have about 25 to 30% in my front you know, my front foundation, it's not really a foundation planting, but my front landscape. And I will say zone six, not enough. I, you know, I look at my garden in the winter and, you know, I've got several conifers. I've got a couple broadleaf evergreens. It's definitely not enough. So Anita, my answer is between 30 and 50%. (laughs) That would be what my answer would be is somewhere in between Um, Because you're pretty close in zone seven to where I'm at in in zone six. And uh, I'm assuming you're still getting snow cover. I'm assuming, you know, you lose most of the leaves on your deciduous plants. So I I would say between 30 and 50%. Yeah. I, I, you know, if you have less than 30, you probably don't have too much. If you have more than 50%, that's quite a lot. Uh, But I would say as you go along, you have to keep evaluating, Hmm. you know, do, do I have enough? Do I not have enough? Um, and it's always easier to add shrubs earlier uh, than later. Exactly. Uh, that, but those those APLD numbers, I think they are they're for designers who don't often design for gardeners. Yeah. And and so what they've done is they've made seventy five percent of the border stuff you don't have to take care of, you know. And they've really <laughs> minimized the amount of the work that the homeowner is going to have to do, which, which is legitimate. I mean, that's that's a totally legitimate thing. Um, but I think for, I for us. For, yeah, for us gardeners, uh, we'd, want, we'd want a little more, you know, to, to play with, you know. Yeah, um, I looked at that breakdown and thought Steve would not abide by that. <laughs> yeah, but Steve's garden looks like, you know, heck. So, um, you know. <laughs> no, you just love perennials. Well, you know, I, I do I do the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. I start with the perennials. Then I'm like, oh, I, I really need a shrub here. And you have to go, you know, and, and, and add in the shrub later on. And it's a real um, pain, you know. And, and I definitely have not used enough evergreens. You know, mm. um, I just I find it hard to commit to one. Yeah, yeah, true. But but my question that builds off of that is is from uh, Leah, Leah, Leah Jaros from Instagram. Uh, and she says, foundation shrubs, having such a hard time finding a nice and interesting variety. I'm in zone 7B. 
And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll answer this one. This one's easy. And I start typing and I started thinking like, well, what makes a foundation shrub? Like, aren't they all, you know, like what wouldn't be a foundation shrub? And I would say something that gets massive uh, or something that's, that's utterly gangly. You know, so those, those are the kind of the extremes, but pretty much anything other than that, I say is fine for a foundation. Um, and so, you know, a, a building, and what was your answer, Daniel? Cause I reached out and I'm like, well, am I missing something yeah. here? And, and what did you say? I said, I think that it should be dwarf. Mm-hmm. It should have multiple seasons of interest. Yeah. Those were my two answers. Um, because if you go with a deciduous shrub as opposed to an evergreen, I think that it needs to do more than just flower in spring. I'm talking to you, Dutzia. <laughs> okay. So uh, I would disagree with, with that um, a, a little bit. I think dwarf depends on like, well, how, how high is the foundation? Like how, how much mm-hmm. are, we, are we talking here? Is this, a, is this a ranch house? You know, we only need to come up three or four feet. Then, yeah, it, it, pretty much every shrub has a dwarf version out there. So, so you can look. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I would say, you know, it's OK. I think there needs to be, uh, again, a certain percentage of evergreens. And it's okay for those evergreens, I think, to be boring in in the summer, in spring and summer, because that's a time when when everything else is shining. That's a time when your perennials mm-hmm. are going, and, and there's so much going on. Um, so I would I would recommend to Leah some evergreens that color up in the winter. And I've talked on here uh, uh, on here about about Karsten's winter gold pine. Mm-hmm. Um, which is one that is kind of green all year. Then when winter and the cold temperatures come along, it turns yellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the same with um, uh, Chief Joseph Lodgepole Pine, uh, which is Pinus contorta uh, variety latifolia, uh, which mm-hmm. it only gets, you know, six feet tall, maybe eventually. So it's not massive. Um, and it call, it's this beautiful gold in uh, in winter. But in summertime, you, you want it to be kind of a nondescript backdrop. For all the other cool showy things, because that's that's when everybody else is there. That's the busy season, you know. Um, you need something that's going to help you out, um, you know, during the times when when everybody else is is faded away. Um, yeah. I uh, I also think that uh, an, any oak leaf hydrangea is probably a good option uh, because they get mm-hmm. big but not too massive. Um, they look good through multiple seasons, and even when they're deciduous, they have a cool structure to them. So if you're going to yeah. do a deciduous shrub, and I think that's okay, I have a bunch. That's what I do. But they have they have interesting habits to them. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, 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 an oak leaf hydrangea is a good uh, option. And then I also like if you have a tough condition because around the foundation can be tough. You know, oh, yeah. it's after it's the building. Bad. Yeah, it's it's just it's cruddy soil. Sometimes it's under the eave, and you don't know what kind of moisture it gets. The house either blocks moisture or sun or, or whatever. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, there's an aronia. There's a chokeberry for that. Um, aronia lowscape hedge gets to be about three to five feet tall. Uh, has flowers in spring, berries that you hardly notice uh, sometime in the summer, but wonderful fall color. And it gets to be about three to five feet tall, and it grows pretty much anywhere uh, and bulks mm-hmm. up. And I have this sort of as the back row in, in part of my uh, foundation planting. And I, I absolutely love it. And uh, it's just wonderful. It, I think it got attacked by Japanese beetles this summer. I've never seen that before. And I've never heard of that being a problem. But something skeletonized some of the leaves on it. Uh, but other than that, this thing will, will grow just anywhere uh, and look cool doing it and be kind of that neutral backdrop of what everybody else is, is doing their thing. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so I'll add, I'll add in any dwarf panicle hydrangea, and I say dwarf because some panicle hydrangeas will get to be thirty feet tall. So um, my favorites are bobo. Um, I also like uh, vanilla strawberry. I have several. I have so many. I have little quick fire as well. So panicle hydrangeas, I love because um, they just keep going and going. They start blooming. They fade all the way into fall. They give you good fall color. And um, I'm in love with Tiny Wine Physocarpus. It's a nine bark. It's a dwarf nine bark that still gets three to four feet tall and wide. Um, I guess that's why I said dwarf, because a lot of dwarf shrubs still get four or five feet tall and wide. But uh, that's a great one. It's got gorgeous burgundy foliage and a beautiful late spring, early summer, pinkish white 
disc shaped flowers that cover the shrub. And then uh, over time, mine have been in, I guess, for four or five years now, the bark starts peeling off in these silver strands that gives it some really cool winter interest. So I think those are my, my top add in add-ins, you know, cause I know you asked for my two cents. So I'm, I'm throwing in my two cents. No, I, I, I thought about, uh, uh, the nine bark as well, physicarpus. Um, so yeah, I, I concur with your diagnosis. All right, Steve. Um, I actually, I have another evergreen question, but I'm going to skip over that. Cause I feel like we've been doing a lot of evergreen questions and, and shrub questions. Uh, here, I'm going to throw a houseplant one at you. So this is from Judy Mitchell Wilson. And Judy writes, streptocarpus, I have failed miserably on trying to keep these plants alive. What are the secrets? Water, temperature, and then multiple question marks afterwards. So clearly Judy has had a lot of issues with streptocarpus. And um, you know why? Because it's a really stinking hard plant to grow. Um, and ah, <laughs> Steve, is, Steve is nodding his head. Um, no, I'm, I'm shaking it, my head. Nodding, yeah, well, disagreeing, shaking, shaking is disagreeing. He's shaking his head. Um, first of all, streptocarpus, there's a huge number of plants that fall into that genus. So it depends on the species. But I would say my biggest thing is I used to work in uh, the nursery business all throughout high school, college, into adulthood. And in the winter, at one of my jobs, I was in charge of the tropical house plant greenhouse and we had a special water for streptocarpus it was distilled water because streptocarpus is incredibly salt sensitive um so a lot of times when you are watering you know from tap water um even through you know if you don't have well water and it doesn't run through any kind of filtration system you're watering through municipal where it went through a salt filter of some kind they are very salt sensitive. So that could be an issue. Um, they are also light sensitive. They don't like bright scalding sunlight, but they don't like to be in a lot of shade. They like a filtered bright light. So, you know, it's kind of that, you know, that perfect spot you have to find of a filtered bright light. Um, and then temperature, you know, it's a tropical. So I think, don't know where you live, but I know in my house, because I live in a colder climate, my house gets cool in the wintertime. And any house plants that I have, depending on their sensitivity to temperature, tend to get a little pouty in the winter when our house falls a little bit colder. So um, those would be my, my top things. Um, I will just say that it, it left such an impression on me when I was younger and caring for an entire bench worth of different species of streptocarpus and knowing that I had to water them with special water <laughs> that I kind of knew, hmm, these might have some issues uh, and, and you're not alone. But Steve apparently can grow them by the by the gang, but by the, by, by the cart well, full. I would just say the um, location, like if they're not happy where they are, they're going to not do well. So you might have to move them around. And if once you find the spot where they are, then they're happy. Do not move them from that spot. Even <laughs> like, oh, well, this is, the, this is, you know, the same, you know, Eastern exposure, but in a different room. No, 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 no. Do not move it. Keep it where it is if it's happy. Then also with the water, we, we, you know, we know like they like to be watered from the bottom. They don't like their leaves to be wet, but you, you can't keep it constantly moist because I almost killed the streptocarpus. I bought it at Logies last year. Mm -hmm. I, almost keep, I almost killed it by keeping it too wet. It has to dry out a little bit and, th and then you water it again. But um, don't let but, it get too dry. Right. Well, you know, my, my, um, my African violets, which are now streptocarpus, um, get, yeah. get dry as a bone. You know, well, and then yeah. I water them, like like I've 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 let them uh, do that. I haven't done that with my my, my straight up streptocarpus, uh, yeah. but but yeah, like to me, like once you give them the right spot, then they'll do just fine. It's all about finding that right spot. So I don't say that, that they're difficult; they're just finicky. You know, you know what I mean? Like like you don't have. I don't think you have to tend to them constantly. And today it's this, and tomorrow it's that, and Wednesday you, okay. you can only you can only feed them one eighth of a thing on every third Wednesday. It's just that their conditions are really specific. 
you know. They're very particular. Yeah, yeah. they're particular. Yeah. All yeah. right. What do you got, Steve? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to head back outside if that's okay. Uh, that's all right. I, I love uh, I love a good top ten list, um, mm. like you know the the best you know such and such of all time. So uh, when Suze ten sixty four from Instagram asked, "What's the best tall flowering plant or vine for the back of my perennial garden? It gets afternoon mm. sun." Um, I'm like, ooh, ooh, I love a best thing. And then, like, I had to keep knocking things off because, well, they're not the best. They're good, but they're not the best. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't even ask me. If anybody has, like, a top 50 albums list, like, don't don't even get involved in that. Um, and, but, but really do because uh, I have thoughts. But what I came <laughs> up with, what I came up with, I came up with three different things. Um, and they were things that, that jumped to mind readily, and I couldn't find things that, that were better. I actually have four. I actually have four, but I'll name three. Um, Wait, I've, you said three, then you went to four. Now you're back to three. All right. And she's only asking for one. So it's the best, the one best. I'm going to give you three. Maybe four. Okay. Okay. Oh, my um, gosh. Go. <laughs> uh, autumn minaret day lily, okay, which, okay. Is, which, is, which is a day lily, gets to be about five to six feet tall, blooms late in the season. All of these bloom late in the season, I think, because, you know, you got to have to spend most of the season getting tall, uh, mm-hmm. and then they can bloom. Uh, but wonderful uh, yellow orange blooms standing over the top, you know, with those those cones just kind of standing over the top of everything else um, late in the season. Always takes my breath away. Super easy to grow. Um, also super easy to grow. Also always, you know, stunning. Um, great for pollinators is uh, Lemon Queen Helianthus, um, which is its common name is what? False sunflower or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Helianthus Lemon Queen just covered in, in, you know, from like August to uh, September in these, the, the yellow daisy like flowers that are just dancing with, with pollinators all over the place. And I, I believe that's a, it's an East coast uh, native uh, as well. Uh, super easy to grow. I don't think it likes to dry out too much because mine were not happy with this summer's drought and I didn't give them any other, any supplemental water. So I'm, I'm thinking that's the, the issue. Um, they get massive. Um, the, if you have voles, don't grow it. Uh, but other than that, just a super, super plant, super plant. You will, you will love the fact that you planted that. Uh, and then I would also recommend uh, ironweed. You know, if you want a tough, low-maintenance plant, look for something called ironweed. Um, it's, you know it does not take a lot of care. So this is uh, New York ironweed. Uh, Vernonia, Nove, Bori, Sora, Sensiensis, Banamarama, uh, Shamalama, Ding Dong, um, zones five to Vernonia. nine. Yeah. Yeah. Vernonia. Look up Vernonia. Uh, Four to six feet tall. And it has like um, like purple flowers, sort of like not not magenta, you know, but sort of like an electric electric purple, um, like tufts, uh, tufts of flowers at at the top of it. Um, Super easy to grow. Great plant. Um, And so you you kind of you have three different looks there. Uh, All tall, all late bloomers, all great, all easy to grow. Um, And I would also throw in there um, Joe Pye weed. Eutropium, um, mm-hmm. if you look at another native option there. That's good. All right. I'm going to throw in meadow rue, the lictrum. I love it. Clouds of purple flowers that mm-hmm. are just very airy, throw up, you know, in late summer, mid to late summer. Love meadow rue. It's really nice too. Tall, very, very tall for the back of the border. Too, too wispy, too wispy. Oh, I love it. And the foliage is really pretty when it comes out in spring too. It looks like rue, really great, glaucous. Great. Yeah, great, great plant, but not top. Not. <laughs> she wanted the best. I mean, all right, fine. All right, Steve, this is my last one. It was a view from the garden chair off of Instagram. Great Instagram handle. Uh, all right, a view from the garden chair writes, suggestions for a small evergreen that does well in part shade. Bonus points if it adds color and texture. I immediately went to cryptomerias and canisiparis. Dwarf cryptomerias and canisiparis. Uh, it's a slow growing conifer. I would say, I would dare say that both cryptomerias and canisiparis have the coolest coloring, the coolest textures of the entire conifer family. I really, really enjoy them. They span from zones four to eight. There are a few selections of cryptomeria that will go into zone nine. Partial shade is actually best 
for these two conifer groups. They tend to burn out in too much sun and in, in too much shade, you'll get very spindly growth and they'll be kind of weak stemmed and not all that attractive. So partial shade is the jam for these. Um, just to name a few cryptomeria that I love so much, uh, curly tops is a good cultivar. It basically is a two to three foot tall and wide shrub that makes the small mound. Its needles are curled into blonde looking dreadlocks. Um, it's got this interesting texture that you just kind of want to ruffle its hair when it, it puts on that color, but it keeps the texture year round. The blonde tips, the blonde highlights to those dreadlocks eventually fade to more of a chartreuse color, but it always looks cool. Um, and then just straight Cryptomeria globosa nana. That's another really cool uh, cryptomeria. Has a similar two by two, three by three form to it. Um, it also has a more chartreuse lime green needle to it. And the needles on each single branch fold up almost as if they're uh, like pine cones almost. So the needles kind of curve up and they look like mop strands off of it. It's just a really cool texture and gives you a little bit of color. Um, for Canisiparis, I'm going to go with my favorite one that's in my garden, which is Canisiparis pacifera snow. It is right. It's a slow growing conifer. I got it at about 12 inches tall. It is now seven years old and it is maybe two to three feet tall and wide. It was quite slow growing, but it's got a very feathery plumish. I don't know, just texture to its overall body of the shrub. And then the tops of it are frosted and white. And it's constantly keeping that color. And in partial shade, it doesn't burn out. It's it's very tough to put it into more sun because the, the tips tend to get that brown burn to it. But that's Canisiparis Pacifera Snow. I absolutely love it and adore it. And the great thing about that is even though it's got this kind of feathery structure, I get tremendous amounts of snow load just because of where it's positioned. It's very close to the edge of our driveway. So the snow plow will plow it over with snow and it's got very, very rubbery stems. It hasn't broken over all of these years. And, and that's, you know, something to consider with conifers that are dwarf. A lot of times they, they tend to get shoveled onto if you live in an area with a lot of snow and they'll break and they really, really, they have brittle stems and they'll break. And, and that that's kind of a bummer because dwarf conifers are expensive. Dwarf conifers are things that you really don't want to look terrible after you've waited so long for them to bulk up. So um, I'll throw a picture of that Canisiparis pacifera snow up on the uh, on our website where you can find plant lists and, and pictures of the stuff we're talking about. So yeah, partial shade conifers. Guy, I think, Steve, didn't you grow Ninja Warrior? Dragon Warrior. Um, oh, right. It's, it's, it's uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it for partial shade because that's where I have mm -hmm. it right now. And it's doing okay, but not great. And it's on my list of things to move in spring. Uh -huh. um, so we'll see if I actually get to it. But it's, uh, I, I couldn't, your list is great. I want to grow all those plants. So I'm not going to add anything to it. <laughs> all right. What do you got for your last one? Uh, I have a question from Nate uh, Marcusen, again, from Instagram. I think we went a little too heavily on the Instagram questions or maybe Instagram people just ask the best questions. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but it just turned out that way. Uh, so Nate asks, uh, could you go into herbaceous border design? Oh, Nate, mm. how, how, how long do oh, you want me to go? Um, I could, I could go on and on. Um, there's, there are actually books, you know, in college courses taught about this. So uh, I'm going to have to keep it kind of, you know, short. Uh, but he goes on to ask how to select plants uh, to fill a role, i.e. upright, mounding, texture, bloom time, and how to begin to prioritize these. Also, Perhaps go into how many types of plants is the sweet spot for adequate variety, but not looking like a collector's border either. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, you know, you're looking for plants that fill a role. You're, you're halfway there. You can rule out things that do not fill a role. What What is the role that needs to be filled there? Uh, and you have to think about 
um, do, do you want text, uh, contrast or harmony? You know, I need something else that supports what's going on here in terms of texture, form, and color, or I need something that adds a dash of contrast to this because it's kind of boring. Um, and so you, you, once you know what your role is, you can begin to narrow down your choices, um, you know, to, to find out what you're going to do. Um, and you have to remember garden design, especially herbaceous garden design, is an ongoing process. And like, nope, that's not working. I need to change that. Or that was working a couple of years ago, but now it's, it's just not. Um, so it's an ongoing process and you try something. If it doesn't work, you know, uh, you're, you're free to change it. Um, prioritize. I would start with the plants you can't do without the ones that knock your socks off. Like I, I gotta have that thing. And then you build off of there. So you have that plant that, that you absolutely love. Um, uh, so now, you know, the roles, I need something that, that also it has the same color. So this doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, or I need something to contrast with it so that this thing, my, the plant that I love doesn't get lost. So people can see it. You know, so if it's got bright chartreuse foliage, you don't want to surround it with other bright chartreuse things because it'll just get lost. So mm-hmm. start with the thing you love, then look for things that either highlight those qualities or contrast with it to help those qualities show. Um, so, so you've got that and you do that three or four times. You've got some vignettes going. Then how do you connect your vignettes? I need something that picks up from this and picks up from that. Um, and it's an ongoing thing and it's the fun part of gardening. Uh, but I think that's the place to go is to start with what you you must grow um, mm-hmm. and how many. Nate, never buy less than three of a plant. Never buy less than three. Five is better, okay? If the plants are large, oh, says says the nursery, you know, industry person, like, oh, buy as many as you can, you know, back up Nate, a truck. <laughs> Nate, if you're not watching this on YouTube where, where you can find the video, I am holding up – fingers and i actually held up three then five and then i went to seven because you know hey if you do five seven's even better <laughs> yeah so the the, th- the thing about it is it depends on the size of the plant if it's a big plant you know you don't need seven of them um, yeah. but you do you do need multiples um, unless something is interesting enough to stand alone as a specimen that's a onesie okay mm-hmm. and you, you don't want a lot of those because like you said it's gonna it's gonna uh, look like a collector's garden so buy mm-hmm. at least three so that you can either plant them in a nice clump so they have a good presence, or you can space them throughout the the, uh, the border to add repetition and unity and rhythm to your border. That's a great thing. Um, and it's a lot easier to do if you have five. You know, it's a, it's a question of how much do you love this plant and how showy is it? You know, if it's really mm-hmm. showy and can stand alone, you know, maybe one and it's big. If Sun you, Morelia. Yeah. Or, or, no, or if you don't. Example. If you like it, but don't love it, get, get three. If you love it and you want it to be like, I want, I really want this throughout my border, get seven, you know, get, get eight or nine, you know, buy them all, you know, whatever you can, you can fit. Um, don't make the mistake that I made. However, um, I have bought plants in large multiples to dot throughout my borders, then place them so far apart in those borders that they might as well not even be you know, in the same place. Their, their impact is lost. Uh, mm-hmm. They can't really provide unity if I have one here and the next one is way over there and the third one is out back somewhere. Like that's mm-hmm. that's a mistake I've made. Um, I wished I had grouped things a lot tighter. Um, but yeah, at least three. Never buy less than three. And if you can only find one of a plant, like I got to have this plant and there's only one, buy two things that go with it. Because then you you have a combination right there, um, and that's going to help stop the the collector's look, and also you know you get you get two extra plants, so that's always cool. That's true. I will say one lesson that I learned from herbaceous design that I did wrong was not expanding my definition of repetition. I thought repetition meant I had to dot the same plant in multiple areas along my border. And in 
expand it, which is really tough if your conditions change drastically, um, you know, your sun exposure or whatever. So I started learning and I'm still learning that, okay, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same plant, but I love this, you know, Biocovo geranium that does really well in this sunny spot. It's low growing, it's white flowering in May. Okay. So down the road in my shadier section of my border, let me find something that's low growing, white flowering in the May, June area. So it's it's a doppelganger basically for that plant that I'm repeating down further in an area because I think it's really hard. It's always, or at least for me, it was really hard for me to wrap my head around that repetition can be expanded. Uh, your, your definition of repetition can be expanded. It doesn't have to be, I, I spent so many years and dollars trying to force plants into sin- scenarios to get repetition that it just wasn't their conditions. Um, so that would yeah. be my lesson learned. Yeah, that, that's a great point because when we talk about repetition, it's not, it could be the same plant or it could be the same color as you just suggested there or the same habit, which you did again with the geranium. Um, mm-hmm. Color, texture, form. Those are the three main elements you're working with. And as long as you repeat those things, you could repeat something with the, with the, with the same texture. You know, bold texture, bold texture, bold texture, and that's going to help bring things together. Um, you know, um, so yeah, repetition doesn't have to come from the same plant. Yeah, but those are those were all really good points, Steve. You might have to write a garden design book. Just saying, in your more spare work, time, more, more work for me. <laughs> and now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter with a few questions of his own. I have been waiting anxiously for the annual question and answer episode because I've been listening to Steve and Danielle and I too have questions, a lot of questions. But here, I will pose only the two that perplex me the most. Steve, you often mention that you frequently, but accidentally, step on some of your plants. I know you're a clumsy, oafish man, so I can well believe this about you. Do any of your plants survive this? I'm also certain that after you trample a plant, you neglect it. Any plant that can be trod upon, forgotten, and still live is one I want to know about. And Danielle, the section of your property that you call Hospital Hill seems to be where you can sign quite a few of your plants. But I'm wondering, do any plants ever make it off Hospital Hill? Hospitals are places of caring, where we seek to heal and recuperate. This rocky, barren slope... Sounds like a place from which no plant ever returns. Abandon all hope, ye who are planted here. If I'm correct, a new name is in order, I think. Might I suggest the inhospital incline or the slope of despair? Both seem to convey more accurately what happens on that hill. Try them out, and I look forward to hearing which one you choose on an upcoming episode. Man, I feel like Peter really came for me on that hospital hill. Well, you know, he's just asking a question that I think we we all have. <laughs> you know who else has a question? Elizabeth Haller from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, actually recorded a question for us. So let's take one last question in this Q&A episode. Let's see what Elizabeth has to say. Hello, my name is Elizabeth and I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I have a question for you on how to start produce gardening. I had a brief foray into growing vegetables A year ago at my sister-in-law's raised beds where I tried to grow some squash, tomatoes, peppers, and herbs, and I did not have very consistent watering practices or pruning, and so I would just pop in once a week and found that I had subsequently a poor harvest and some of my, all of my squash just completely died. I'd like to start again as I have a new sunny plot in my home garden that I can tend a little more closely, and I just don't know where to start. Do you have any recommendations for good books or online resources for just a basic beginner's guide to starting from seed or from small plants, particularly if there's anything specific to the upper Midwest area? Hey, Elizabeth, great question about vegetable gardening. Vegetable gardening is hard. 
I will just say it. It really is. Everybody says, oh, it's so easy. Start with vegetables. Vegetables aren't easy to grow um, or they, they can tend to be difficult to grow. But I would first thing I would say is you were talking about references to get started with seed starting and crop selection. And I'm going to do a shameless plug here. <laughs> we are going to release actually a special issue onto the newsstands in late March from Fine Gardening, and it's the Vegetable Gardening Guide. And it's going to go over things like seed starting, how to, you know, troubleshoot with problems in the vegetable garden, crop recommendations. We're even going to do regional veggies, which are, you know, best for your area to grow. So I would say that's number one. So that's my shameless plug. But Nikki Jabor is a really accomplished author. She's also a, a frequent contributor to fine gardening. She's a She has a 3,000 square foot vegetable garden in Nova Scotia. So if she can grow vegetables, I'm pretty sure anybody can. She has a great, a great newer uh, book out, and I think it's called Veggie Garden Remix. And she is just a, a consummate expert. If there's a question you've got about vegetable gardening, she's a good person to, to tap into. The other thing I was going to say is, gosh, don't overlook your local extension service through your local university. And I actually looked yours up and it looks like uh, South Dakota State University is has an extension service. Looks like they've got about six different stations scattered around the state. I love going to my local extension service because they are able to then tap into the university system of, hey, I've got this bug on my cucumber. What the heck is going on? And that person that you reach out to at the extension agency might not know, but they're going to go and tap a plant pathologist or an etymologist that's from your area and get the exact answer that you need for your location. And I can't stress enough that extension agencies are where it's at for regionalized gardening information because they know. They know what you're going through, basically. And my last thing is, you know, from my own personal experience, because I grow vegetables, I have a vegetable garden, is I love raised beds. I've grown both in the garden, uh, in ground gardening and raised beds. I love raised beds because it extends my season on both, you know, the spring side of things and in the fall I will say, I know out in South Dakota, you've got serious vole issues because I'm dealing with an author that <laughs> that's from your area that has vole issues. So make sure you're stapling hardware cloth underneath those raised beds if you go that route. So burrowing critters won't come up through your raised beds and eat your vegetables. I didn't do that. I ended up having to deconstruct my beds a couple years ago, restaple hardware cloth onto the bottom, and then refill them again. So save yourself the trouble as far as that's concerned. And my last thing is leaf mold is just a magic ingredient for vegetable gardening. So if you can incorporate leaf mold into your, your garden, it's incredible. It improves the soil structure. It improves the water retention. It's just, it's magic. It's such magic. Steve, I didn't, I'm sorry. I just went off. Do you have any advice? Uh, well, vegetable gardening is not my uh, forte. And as someone who has failed too, I will say you can succeed at it because I've grown things too. The two key elements there are water and sunlight. Mm. They need a lot of water. Vegetables need a lot of water, but not too much. Consistent water. Yes, consistent is 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 better than than a lot, and they need as much sun as you can give them. And I imagine South Dakota. Uh, I, I've never been there. I, I imagine you know vast stretching you know uh, plains, big sky country where um, sunlight shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, sun and water, and then the other thing I would recommend would be to talk to people because there's people love to talk about their success with vegetables and, and the things that they do that work. Ask somebody you know. What, what's your favorite tomato? But make sure you have like a good, you know, 30 to 45 minutes because they're going to go on about their favorite tomato, you know. <laughs> and that's how we, we learn. We learn from one another about what, what works. I mean, what works in Connecticut is not necessarily what's going to work in, uh, in, in South Dakota. So, so talk to people and also try things. You know, you can become that that expert that you need. Like I've I've tried that tomato variety that Fine Gardening recommended. That one didn't work so good. But the one I do recommend is this one. You know, yeah. and that's that's great information. So keep trying because gardening is always it's a process. It's not a, it's not a um, you know, it's not like home design 
where like you, you put in your living room and then you're done, you walk away. It's a constant thing and you're nurturing living things and every year is different. So embrace the change, embrace the, the, the quest for, for the, the vegetables that work for you and what works in South Dakota to grow these things. Yeah, and then report back because I really do want to know what tomatoes do best in South Dakota. You know, Danielle, I like the Q&A episode because it uh, fits into my perfect mantra of uh, do as I say, not as I do. (laughs) Oh, that's so true, Steve. That's so true. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. We can't wait to answer more next time.